Tonight we begin a new study on the Holy Spirit. For many, He's neglected, ignored, misunderstood, or just simply overlooked. Arthur W. Pink once wrote that it isn't so much that we have wrong thoughts about the Holy Spirit, it's just that we don't think of Him at all. And I think that's true. A lot of us don't think of Him, and perhaps we don't put a lot of emphasis on the Holy Spirit because we don't want to go too far in an um, uh, emotional kind of uh, demonstration or uh, sense of worship. But He is a person. He's not an it. He's a person. The third person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And there's much to learn about Him and perhaps some things we need to correct in our understanding of the Holy Spirit. And we want to do that as we begin this study uh, tonight. And we'll be looking at John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Let me read them for you uh, this evening. John writes these words from Jesus. Jesus says, I will pray the Father and He will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Let's pray. Father, help us this evening as we endeavor to look at Holy Spirit and begin to understand a little bit better about His ministry, His work, and uh, the way that He helps and strengthens and guides us. Uh, anoint us with your understanding tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we look at the Holy Spirit, we want to look at the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and see the promise that, God has, that Jesus gave to us and that God has fulfilled. Now, remember, in the first part of this chapter, uh, Jesus has been talking about his soon leaving the disciples. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house so many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. He's sharing this time with the disciples in these critical moments before he uh, goes to the cross, actually, before he begins his passion, before uh, the end of the meal, and he goes uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane, and the, pro the, the passion begins as um, uh, he's arrested and tried and all of the things that happened to him after that. So he's sharing with them some information, and he says to them, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I am not going to leave you by yourself. One of the things that I suppose bothers us the most when someone dies is the fact that they're, they're leaving us. They're, they're gone. We, we don't have their physical presence with us anymore. We can't ask them the questions that we want to ask. We, we don't have that fellowship that we have enjoyed for quite some time with them. But Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he will send you another comforter. And another, it, it, the word here is for another of the same kind. Now, one of the things that we see in this, it is somewhat an unconditional promise. God, Jesus didn't say, if you do this and 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 this, and this then I will. He says, simply in the, first, in the verse previous to that, if you love me and keep my commandments. Now, that was based upon the fact that if you just trust him, he's going to pray the Father to send the comforter to you. He, you don't have to do a lot of stuff. We're going to explore that a little bit as we go along. This is an unconditional promise. God does the gifting. He says in here, I will pray the Father. I will ask my Father, God the Father. And the Father does the gifting. If we look over in uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking quite a bit about the gifting of the Holy Spirit. And he has this to say in chapter 12. God has set the members the individuals in the church, 
each one of them just as he pleased. Now, he has shared just before that, that God is the one who gives the gifts. And God has placed those gifted members in the church. You're not here by accident, my friend. You may think you made the choice, but God brought you here. For some reason, for some purpose, some way God brought you to this place. He may have used your parents. You may be here because you grew up in this church. But that was God's design. That was God's plan. I firmly believe that out of all the churches in uh, Suffolk, Virginia, that I could have been brought up in, God ordained and planned for me to be brought up into the First Baptist Church of Suffolk and all of the things that I was exposed to helped to fashion and to shape me and to make me the person that I am today. God has you here for a reason, according to what Paul said in the book of Corinthians. He also helps us to realize that this is a free gift. He says, I'll pray the Father and He will give you. Now, he won't loan you. He won't sell you. He won't rent to you the Holy Spirit or another helper. But He will give you a free gift. You don't pray for it. You don't work for it. You don't even wait for it. He gives you that free gift when you're saved. And it is a continual gift. It will abide with you forever, he says in the latter part of verse 16. You can't lose it. Now, I can lose my keys. I can lose some money. I can lose stuff on my desk. I can put it down and lose it, forget where I put it. I can lose things, but I cannot lose the Holy Spirit. He is there with me wherever I go. He's always with us. He says He will abide with you forever. And the word abide means to remain with, to, con to continue, to dwell with. He is with you. He is tabernacled, if you please, with us. So He is always with us. That is the promise that Jesus gave to us and to His disciples. But there's another thing, not just the promise, but why was He giving us the Holy Spirit? What is the purpose of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in our life? One of the purposes is to quicken us, to make us alive. Ephesians talks about this. Um, in Corinth, he talks about this. In Corinthians, that we are uh, become new creations in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are new creations. Why? Because Holy Spirit has indwelt us and, if you please, recreated us, made us new creations in Him, given us a different want to, a different mindset. Ephesians talks about us being quickened in Christ, made alive in Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who energizes us. Now, when you're saved, the Holy Spirit has had a part in that salvation. Let me read Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by the works of righteousness which we have done. It goes right along with what Paul said. Uh, when he said that it's not by uh, it's by grace, not by works that we're saved, he says it's not by the works of righteousness which we have done anything that we have done, but it is according to His mercy that He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's not by anything we have done, by our good works, by our. Uh, punishing ourselves by any kind of uh, penance that we might have done. It's nothing that we have done. It's not our family heritage. It's not coming to church all the time. It's not being baptized. It has nothing to do with what we have done, but everything to do with what the Holy Spirit has done. The Holy Spirit has drawn us, convicted us. We have surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and at that moment, we are saved. 
He has quickened us. But he's also there to encourage us. He is a helper to comfort us. Uh, Some translations say, I will give you another comforter. Now, in our day and time, we think about a comforter as something like a blanket, a quilt, or something of that nature that we throw around our shoulders and warm ourselves when we're chilled. It is something that brings us a sense of nice warm fuzzies. There's more to it than that in this verse and in the fact of the Holy Spirit being a comforter. Comforter comes from two uh, Greek words, come, which means with, and fortis, meaning to fortify. So the Holy Spirit is come to be with us, to fortify us. One translation puts it as putting a a steel rod down our backbone, giving us some backbone, giving us some strength. You know, too often we have cowered away from opposition. Somebody has come to us with with an alternate uh, philosophy, an alternate opinion, and they're strong and they're voiceful and and, uh, present a a great front. And we back up and and we retreat a little bit because we don't want to get involved. We we don't want to get involved in a problem or a trouble. But Holy Spirit is there to give us backbone, to give us courage, to give us strength. What do you think Peter had? When Peter cowered at the the court of uh, uh, the high priest and ran away weeping because he had denied Jesus, he didn't have much of a backbone, did he? But Peter stood up before great kings and emperors and he declared the truth of God. All of a sudden he got a backbone, as we might say. Where did that come from? That was the Holy Spirit fortifying him, comforting him, coming alongside him, giving him strength and power. An old lexicon defined the word paraclete, which this word is translated from, as being one who pleads the cause before a judge, a counsel for the defense. Someone who studies our case, hears our testimony, and then expresses this on on our behalf to someone else. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That sounds like a defense counselor, doesn't it? That sounds like someone who's standing up beside you, pleading your cause with power and might and strength. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He is there to encourage us to help us in our faith, to give us that encouragement to speak truth to those that we come in contact with. But he's also there to be a companion. He says that he will never leave us or forsake you. He dwells with you. He is there 24-7, 365. Now, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. But he is to be a companion with us. All the time. Now we've looked at the promise. We've looked at the purpose. I want to look at some of the particulars about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. One of the things we see, He is in you, not with you. Now, if someone is with you, they can become separated from you. Can they not? Have you ever been walking down a street and someone's coming forward toward you and all of a sudden there's someone right, you know, there's someone with you, maybe a husband, a wife, a child or something, and all of a sudden you kind of separate. One goes on one side and one goes on the other side. Maybe it's a pole that you're approaching or some immovable object. And so one goes on one side and one goes on the other side. You're somewhat separated. Or you may be shopping and, and you're walking along and all of a sudden you see something and, and you fix your attention on that, but the other person's not paying a whole lot of attention. Or maybe they have been drawn off by something else and before you know it, you're separated and, and you don't know where they are. That, that's happened many a time when I've been shopping or uh, with uh, Mark or with uh, my wife and, and all of a sudden I look and, and they were not there now I found them quickly but um, 
nonetheless, we got separated. Sometimes that separation may take a while before you get back together, before you come back into the same uh, proximity together. So being with somebody doesn't necessarily mean that you have close fellowship and communion. I have seen people with someone in a restaurant, and they're not communicating at all. They're, they're, not, uh, they're just there. But Holy Spirit, he says, is not with you. He's in you. He does say he, will, he dwells with you, but he'll be more than that. He'll be in you. So where you go, he goes. What you listen to, he listens to. What you watch on TV or, or out in the world, he's watching with you. You cannot check the Holy Spirit at the door and go in and do something else. You don't leave the Holy Spirit in the pew like you leave your Bible so that it'll be there next time you come to church. He goes with you wherever it is you go. And so remember that the next time you're tempted to listen to something that may not be particularly spiritual or to watch something that is not fit for your eyes to see and to watch. Remember, Holy Spirit is in you. And so wherever you go, you're taking the Holy Spirit. When you go to work, the Holy Spirit's with you. So when you're prone, when, you, when you're prompted to witness to somebody, and you say, oh man, I wish I had the Holy Spirit with me. <laughs> Hello, you do. He's right there with you to encourage you, to help you, and to be with you and in you whenever you have a need. And another thing that we need to understand is that it is a complete process. You don't get Him progressively. You don't get part of the Holy Spirit now and another part in six months or a year or somewhere down the road. You get all of the Holy Spirit that you're ever going to get. And you get this at the time that you're saved. You get all the Holy Spirit. You say, well, what, what are we talking about the filling? We're going to talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit a little bit more uh, in detail a little later. But just for now... It's not that we leak, it's just that we kind of push the Holy Spirit into a place where He's not got all of us. In fact, the best way to look at it is to ask yourself the question. It's not so much the question if you have the Holy Spirit, but whether the Holy Spirit has you. Whether the Holy Spirit is controlling you. Whether the Holy Spirit is activated in your life. One of the things that I have used so often, and you've heard me say this uh, before, it was an illustration given to me uh, years and years ago when I was a youth minister. A man had a cup full of water. And he asked the person to come, uh, one of the youth leaders to come up, there on the platform with him, and he held that cup of water, and he told the man to hit his arm. So he hit his arm, and when he hit his arm, water went all over everywhere. And he asked the question, why was it that water spilled out of the cup? Well, we began to give answers, and obviously we said, because the man hit you jostled your arm to which the speaker said no that's not the reason we gave some other reasons along the way and none of those were correct and finally the speaker said the reason water came out of this cup when I was jostled was because water was in the cup you see whatever is in the cup is going to come out when we are jostled by the world, when we are hit by the world, when the world attacks us. And if hatred and uh, anger and bitterness is in the cup, then that's what's going to come out. And you see, that's what happens if we're not 
filled with the Holy Spirit. We are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. We got all the Holy Spirit at the moment we're saved that we're ever going to get. You're not going to get a second, a third, or fourth blessing of the Holy Spirit. Or you're not going to get an, a second, or third indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You got all the Holy Spirit. So when we talk about the filling of the Spirit, we're talking more about the Holy Spirit getting more of you, getting access to more of you, getting all that bitterness, all of that anger, all that stuff out of the way, so that when you are shaken, He's what comes out. And Holy Spirit gets all over everybody involved. You received the Holy Spirit the moment you were saved. You got all of Him that you'll ever need. And He's indwelling you right now. And what you do with Him and what you allow Him to do in and through you is your choice. Whether you yield to Him or whether you resist Him, that's your choice. Pray with me. Father, help us to understand more fully the work of Holy Spirit in our life, what He desires to do, what He was sent to do, and that we might allow Him to do just that in our life. That we would give Him the full yieldedness of ourselves to Him so that He can cleanse and purify and guide and direct and instruct us and do all of the things that He is wanting to do in our life. Thank You for the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit that You gave to us when we were saved, knowing that we would need help and strength along the way. So guide us and help us to activate that, to, to allow Holy Spirit to work through us and not to hinder His work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.